All right, so the first speaker for the afternoon session is Vaughn Pratt. His title is up here, and I'll let you read it. It's a very long title, so I won't even waste my time reading it. <laughs> Hopefully by now you've already read it. Uh, well, too, uh, too much of my talk to read it. Uh, let me move on to the uh, next thing, uh, which is uh, this slide. And we, we have here a, uh, a modern-day uh, constructive logician uh, standing in front of a, a painting of a uh, probably one of the very first uh, constructive logicians. And if you read his postulates, uh, they're not assertions. They're things like, well, to construct a line segment uh, with two points, and uh, that's the first postulate. In fact, uh, uh, there are more, but I would like to say happy birthday before I say the more. Uh, happy birthday. And I think I first met you at exactly the same day, maybe, even as Anil. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we were uh, both in uh, Moscow. We both traveled up to Lake Tidieri. And we were both, before that trip, we were both at this uh, right, rather, um, uh, wild Russian uh, banquet where Margot and my children were very embarrassed at seeing me try to copy you and how quickly you could guzzle. <laughs> Three years ago. So thank oh, you. So yeah, so yeah. Yeah. Under the table. Yeah. I wasn't embarrassed for my family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, well, let's see. So, um, okay, so here, it might, let me remind you of what that gentleman on the previous slide, the one on the right, I mean, uh, uh, said uh, back in uh, the Elements, which was around 350 BC or so. Uh, he said that two points determine a line segment. This is in the modern translation. He didn't use the word line segment. That's how we think today. So I'm sort of updating all of this. Uh, and the line segment may be extended indefinitely. Two points determine a circle. Uh, all right angles are, and, and by the way, specified that it was done with a compass, and that's not necessary, you'll see shortly. Uh, all right angles are congruent, uh, which is a strange statement, I haven't used that. And inclined lines meet, right? If they're tilted over, then they bump into each other. Um, okay. Uh, so, um, th this, this business of what Euclid wrote uh, at the time seemed terribly formal, and everyone was so amazed that for uh, many centuries thereafter, it sort of set the pace for rigor in mathematics, which is amazing. Uh, but then around about 1880, when people started agonizing about things and getting more formal, uh, they turned around and said, well, wait a moment, that might have been fine for the, up to the previous century, but uh, let's uh, now tidy this up a bit. We will, as I call it, modernize Euclid. Uh, that term wasn't in use. They called it either foundations of geometry or sometimes synthetic geometry. And so we have a series of uh, works, all of which are aimed at uh, giving their idea of how to do it. And there's quite a variety here. And by the way, they're all done from a logical perspective. Uh, there's no attempt to use algebra. Uh, in fact, the first uh, uh, sort of thing in that spirit that used any algebra was uh, within the last sort of century, uh, Wander Schmuller, one of uh, Tarski's former students, uh, who in uh, 1981, and then uh, posthumously a uh, ghost-written version of the same thing, which became a book, uh, wrote uh, From Affine to Euclidean Geometry. Uh, Jeremy Avogad in 2009, with two of his uh, colleagues, uh, wrote in the Review of Symbolic Logic, a paper on uh, understanding uh, Euclid's system and trying to make it uh, rigorous but more faithful to Euclid. In other words, go look at the uh, axioms, look at what Euclid says and see uh, whether maybe it was actually more rigorous than the 19th century people thought it was. And so that's what uh, Abigail et al. was doing. And Michael Beeson has uh, more recently uh, been doing intuitionistic uh, logic of Euclid with a thing he calls, an axiom system he calls Euclidean constructive geometry, and uh, his uh, uh, starts there, his main theorem there, is that uh, anything that's provable in ECG implies that it's ruler and compass constructible. And so all you constructive guys uh, uh, should appreciate uh, what Beeson has done. Now, Schmiel's work is closer to our work in that it emphasizes uh, the transition from affine to uh, the full thing, the full Euclidean geometry. However, uh, and it's also uh, closer in that it's more algebraic. But to her, and to uh, one of her uh, co-workers who co-authored earlier papers, uh, with her, not Tassie, but somebody else. In fact, she's worked with both Tassie and somebody in Poland, I think. Uh, but her notion of algebra is the same numeric one as informs linear algebra. So if you come to it and you say, oh, goody, somebody's last doing Euclid uh, from an algebraic perspective, you are disappointed because it just looks like uh, the way that they do it for linear algebra. So, uh, and, but that's already been done. It was done most notably by Grassmann in uh, 1844, which nobody could figure out, so he tried to write it more clearly in 1862. Still couldn't figure it out. <laughs> nope. Uh, go back and look at it and say, it's incredible. He invented the whole subject. But of course, uh, in those days, people weren't thinking in terms of exterior algebras. They had no idea what that was. They had no, and he wasn't terribly clear. It wasn't like he used sort of, you know, tried to make it crystal clear to everybody. He just sort of saw at things. And, 
had the intuition, and oh, okay, that's how it works. And you can see that he had the intuition, and you can also see that he wasn't communicating it terribly clearly, but uh, people have to give him credit now for inventing the subject. Uh, a simplified version of the subject in terms of vectors was developed independently by uh, Gibbs and by Heaviside uh, at around the same time. Heaviside wrote, wrote a series of papers in The Electrician. You can see he's a practical sort of guy, but he nevertheless figured out uh, how to turn uh, the Quaternion approach of Maxwell's equations into uh, what we would consider today a more traditional vector-based account of the same thing. And in the process, Heaviside simplified Maxwell's 20 equations down to the four that you get on t-shirts at MIT, if you're at MIT, mandatory t-shirts. Um, <laughs> right, and, and, and Gibbs in parallel did the same thing, except his background was more thermodynamics rather than electricity, but both of them needed vectors for their uh, respective efforts. Okay, so the goal of the present work is to make Euclid's uh, synthetic geometry uh, uh, no longer the opposite of algebraic. We want to make it just as algebraic and hence constructive as Descartes' analytic geometry has become, but while respecting Euclid's avoidance of numbers. You see, that was the thing that, that Schmieloff missed out on, that when she made it algebraic, she said, well, algebra is all about numbers. What does it have to be? And we know that from Bull. Bull had this beautiful algebra of logic. That, uh, we only realized you know, half a century later that it could be Boolean algebra could be about numbers. In fact, it's a Boolean ring. But up to that point, it was just a Boolean lattice, and the idea that it could actually be about numbers never occurred to anybody. In fact, it is Boolean logic. It's really the algebra of arithmetic mod 2, exclusive or, and multiplication. OK, so, um, right. Uh, um, oh, I wanted to say that um, uh, the thing that makes algebra constructive is that you don't get these existential statements that uh, characterize first order logic, where they say, oh, it's, it's something or other. And, and uh, what uh, uh, Gödel and, and, and uh, um, um, uh, uh, what constructive traditions, traditions, magicians in general, so Sergei in particular, uh, uh, pushed is this idea that you really want to take these existential quantifiers and scholarize them. Well, algebra does that from the outset. It just says, uh, we'll scholarize everything that we need to talk about, and then we never, don't need to use existential statements, at least not in the algebraic, sort of the core, the algebraic core. So that's what we're doing here. We want an algebraic core such that there are no scholars. We don't no need to scholarize anything because we've done it in advance. Okay, so rational numbers had been presumably in use for thousands of years before Euclid, and uh, uh, Max Dean co-authored a rewrite of Moritz Patch's uh, Ulla Sungen on uh, geometry in uh, 1926, many years after Patch had first written it. And uh, then in an appendix wrote that uh, the absence of numbers in the first four books of the elements might have been a reaction of the Greeks to the then recent discovery of irrational numbers. Uh, and that before then, everybody had been happily using Cartesian coordinates for, for millennia uh, to do their geometry. And so this got around the big concern about uh, Cartesian coordinates that, uh oh, uh, uh, square root of two, what the heck is that? So let's not have square root of two in this. Let's try and do things in a way that doesn't trip over these irrationalities, or doesn't force us to sort of come so close to the irrationalities to see them quite so closely. So that's what's more or less uh, Max Dean thought was going on there. Um, okay. So here's the five postulates again. Right, so the line segment, uh, two axial, two postulates, uh, the circle, the right angles, and the uh, two lines that are leaning towards each other, famously called the fifth postulate, which everybody has heard of. They may not know what the first two through the fourth postulates are, but everybody knows what the fifth postulate is, even though Euclid only put it last. Uh, okay, so uh, here's uh, it, the same thing, but made more constructive with algebra. Uh, so two points determine a line segment, namely their convex hull. And I'm going to formalize things in such a way that it'll be obvious what that means. Um, on the other hand, uh, it obviously shouldn't be in the first position because there's going to be a lot of machinery coming up there. So we're not going to start with the first postulate for that reason. Uh, and, and that happens, by the way, in modern algebra. You do not start with the reals or the rationals. You start with the integers. And so that's what we're doing. We're reorganizing Euclid to look more conventional. Uh, so uh, postulate two, the one I promised we'd start with, is that a line segment AB may be extended to twice its length by making a copy of it, right? So that makes it uh, completely constructive. It's not just indefinitely extending it. We actually make it twice as long. Uh, and that uh, creates not just one uh, segment twice as long, but it actually creates two, because we've copied the starting segment, stuck it on the end. So we've created two segments, the same length <coughs> and then the whole thing. 
Are you going to take equally length as primitive or actual length as primitive? Uh, I think the distinction is because the whole concept of length isn't in here. Though I've got, oh, okay. no, I haven't given you the axioms yet. Oh, I'm telling you the intuitions. Okay. Why don't you wait for the axioms and then re-ask your question? Okay. Uh, but actually, I'll answer that question in about three or four slides. Um, okay, two points A and E determine a circle, and you might say, oh, well, look, look at it. as long as you've got a compass, uh, you can always produce a circle. So what else do you need? Ah, but suppose you left the compass at home that you had brought your set square with you. What would you do? Right, so what you do is you take, um, uh, you've got two points, and you stick the set square in there like that, and you slide it around and let the tip trace out a circle. Right? Everyone knows that? that the, if that's the diameter of the circle, then you can slide the set square around. So even if you left your compass at home, you've still got your set square to draw a circle with. And so, in fact, uh, we have uh, two ways of doing it. And the reason that these are here is not because you might have left your compass at home, but because uh, I actually need this to construct the constructible numbers. Uh, I can't do it alone with a compass. I have to use a set square as well as a compass in this, with this technique in order to construct the constructible numbers purely algebraically. Okay, uh, all right angles are congruent and they arise in the foot of a perpendicular. That makes it a little less mysterious. Uh, right? That's where they come from. Uh, they also come from, uh, notice I'm already using it in three. The last line in three is, refers to four, so that suggests that maybe four ought to precede three. Uh, and finally, inclined lines meet, and they meet at the extension of the trapezium witnessing inclination. So what normally witnesses inclination is a pair of angles such that when you add them together, they come to less than 180 degrees, right? And you want these lines to be leaning in towards each other, so you take this angle and this angle, you add them up, and if they're less than 180, then uh, the fifth postulate promises you that these lines will eventually meet. So here's another way to do it. Um, draw a line parallel, uh, starting somewhere here, parallel to this, and then slide this point up until this is now half the length of this, right? Call that the witness trapezium witnessing the fact that they're inclined to each other. If, they are, if you can't get it to be half the length, then you say, oh, well, I guess I need to find some other witness trapezium somewhere, or maybe we're not in the right space or something. Once you've got that, you just extend each of these to twice their length, and you have actually created the intersection point that Euclid non-constructively promises you. So here's an actual construction of the thing. So this is more constructive than Euclid in that sense. And it's using algebra. So this has actually got all sorts of nice things about it. And it's incredibly usable. Like, I've been using this to build balloons and things in three dimensions. Uh, and doing this on the computer, it's so much easier to think like Euclid did than to play around with these messy coordinates. OK, so I'm going to slide on. Right, I'm going to this right down slowly. Uh, Euclid's ordering of his postulates. Uh, yeah, he put them in a strange order. Um, I don't like the order. That's all there is to say about that slide. Um, <laughs> So, uh, we're going to reorder them. So, uh, Euler was the first to realize, pretty much exactly two millennia after Euclid, that postulates 1, 2, and 5 uh, define affine geometry. And 3 and 4 expand on that by introducing notions of distance and angle. Now, affine geometry augmented with an origin is what we call linear algebra today. Uh, linear algebra with an inner product is, gives us distance and angle. Uh, dot product of zero, that product of zero there at right angles. Uh, and the uh, square root of the dot product of, uh, uh, of things uh, gives you the, uh, uh, something with itself gives you its length. So this separates Newton's five postulates into the affine part, one, two, five, plus three, four gives you the uh, inner product portion. Okay, so postulates two and five are independent of any notion of density, just like the integers are, and so logically we would put them first today. And uh, so two is a prerequisite for five. Uh, because uh, I can't really talk about five without a notion of extension, as you saw just here a minute ago. Okay, so uh, that means that we've got an order one, two, five. That's forced it now, and they define a self-contained discrete affine geometry as a geometric counterpart of abelian groups. And it's postulate five that makes them abelian, and we'll see what happens when you relax the abelian condition if I ever get to the end of the talk. Um, okay, postulate one introduces density in terms of energy centroid. That's going to be an operation that I define for you informally, inductively, but the actual formal definition entails no induction. Uh, it will simply be the expansion of the induction, uh, giving me uh, just a set of equations. It will have to be an infinite set because I've expanded out the induction. But now I've got a variety, uh, albeit without a finite excitization. So that's the affine portion. That's how much. Truly, it's just two operations, uh, extension and uh, centroid. 
Okay, so uh, beyond infinity, uh, beyond affinity. All right, so the other one was uh, to, to affinity and beyond. Uh, so beyond affinity, the same reason that makes postulate three into the power to makes it a problem child, uh, we need uh, two operations, because uh, it's really so powerful you can't do it with one. Um, the, the concept is so powerful, I mean. The idea of a compass is not strong enough. We need the set square and the compass. Okay, postulate four by comparison is easily disposed of with a single total operation. So that's why we put it first. And so you can see there that uh, we've got four before three, and that's the final order, and that is forced on me by these considerations. Okay. All right, so here they are. So there's five, there's five postulates, five operations, and you might want to match them up objectively, but you don't. Uh, what happens is postulate three steals an, a, a, an operation from postulate five. Postulate five doesn't need its operation, so it generously gives it to postulate three, which is so uh, strong that it actually needs two operations. So it's the hairy one. All right, so operation two, extend A, B to C, extends A, B to A, C twice as long. Operation one, uh, it's simply the centroid of endpoints. That's a finitary operation with arities from two onwards. Um, the operation perp ABC drops a perpendicular from the point C to the line AB. Uh, now here we get to the two complicated uh, operations. Uh, this, this defines the concept of a circle in two different ways. So we have, first of all, norm of ABC. And what that's doing intuitively is it's taking um, uh, three points ABC, it's using two of them to define the circle in the manner of Euclid. And then it takes a point C somewhere, anywhere, inside or outside the circle, anywhere except sitting on A itself. And it just drops the ray from A to C, intersects it here, and says, OK, we've normalized AC to the length of AB. So you can think of it either as a thing that creates circles. Uh, and so it creates circles in the sense that uh, the image of norm AB with a, a, a varying argument C creates, traces out the entire circle. Um, and uh, now we have the other operation, tangent. Uh, so in this case, uh, C, instead of being used, uh, sort of being normalized onto the circle, it's um, sent over to the horizon. So it's, uh, instead of looking at the nearest point to you, like you're flying a plane around and you look down at the ground, Instead of asking, where would I land if I jumped out of the plane? Uh, you ask, uh, how far can I see? And so we're looking at this tangent point T, and that forms a right angle here. And that's where the set square comes in, because there is now implicitly a second circle here, whose diameter uh, looks like that. Right? And so what we're doing implicitly is we're intersecting a circle with diameter AC with this other circle AB. And uh, so there's really... Uh, multiple ways to think about circles. Okay, um, Okay. so geodesic spaces. We are now putting on our algebra hat and we are thinking in pure algebra terms. So uh, up to now we have this, oh by the way, uh, I probably uh, down at the bottom here there's, uh, oh I didn't, okay, anyway I'm abbreviating everything. So where I abbreviate? Oh yeah, there we go. Um, so the, the abbreviations ECP, MT are the obvious ones for extend, centroid, perp, norm, and tangent. Okay, um, so uh, a geodesic space is an algebraic structure with a binary operation x, y, obviously not commutative, um, nor associative for that matter, uh, and uh, geometrically we think of it as the extension of the segment a, b to a third point c, and it satisfies these conditions, x, x equals x, right, so it's important, so this gets around the question of what happens if the lines have to be distinct, now you can't do algebra, of course you can do algebra, you just say if they're not distinct, then something happens, and namely, uh, x, x is really a point, not a line. Uh, x, y, y, that's uh, associated to the left. So do your x, start here is x, y. Get one more point, that's x, y, y. Right. And now turn around and go back, right? Go back to where you started. That's the, that's answers, uh, that answers um, Harvey's question. <laughs> that answers Harvey's question. <laughs> I'm struggling with everybody's name here because my mind goes blank with names. Uh, so that answers Harvey's question, namely, uh, we just simply say that uh, the distances are the same in, in this manner. Uh, it's like group theory, right? This is sort of a variant of, of group theory. Um, okay, and here's the bit that makes it abelian. Uh, no, actually, sorry, this bit does not make it abelian groups. It's just makes it coherent. Uh, namely, we have a, a, a right, distributive, right, distributive, right distributivity principle, uh, which um, uh, is this. These, these buttons are not uh, humanly uh, 
engineer to, to memorize <laughs> what they do. Um, who was I? Okay. Oops, that's the wrong button too. It's this one. There we go. Uh, good. Okay. Uh, and then this one. Yes, that's right. There we go. Um, okay. So what this is doing is it's saying that given a point x, given points x, y, and x, y, right? So you can think of that as sort of marching along, and there's the third point in some geodesic. So take a point z over here and reflect x through there. You get xz. Uh, here's y goes through there. That's yz. Uh, so you'd like to know where, uh, what happens to xz, yz. Well, it goes over to xz, yz. Can you read sideways? I can read sideways. That's amazing. Um, and that should be equal to xy being projected through z. So in other words, you've taken a geodesic, reflected it, or inverted it through a point, and that should be another geodesic. So that's what that's saying. Um, okay, so the canonical example is the underlying set of a group equipped with the binary operation x, y inverse x, right? It's two arguments. And you'll find that that satisfies these axioms, even if it's not abelian. Okay, and there's also uh, a concept of quantal that emerged after uh, Gavin Wraith and uh, uh, Conway, Don Hope Conway, uh, agonized over this. Hon Conway kind of got things off in the wrong foot. Uh, Wraith's intuition was this. Conway said, oh, you've got this. Wraith didn't argue. And so it ended up that the notion of quantal is really based on this intuition, and that there are two separate concepts. There's a pair of them. This is all very confusing in the literature. Okay. Uh, the free geodesic, geodesic spaces uh, uh, have the following property, that every geodesic term over a set of variables is equivalent to one containing neither parentheses nor adjacent rep repetitions. And that accounts for everything. So I've now told you the free spaces. Uh, as a corollary, if it's two variables, then they code the integers as follows. Uh, the generators x and y uh, here uh, can be understood as 0 and 1. Uh, the next step is 2, then that's 3 and 4. And then if you run the whole thing backwards, you get the negative numbers. Uh, x and y, uh, 0 and 1. Uh, if, you read a, if you read a term, the parity is on the left and the sign is on the right. So more like the order Turing prefers to write his binary numbers. Uh, but not quite exact, it's not exactly binary arithmetic. And I'll use the notation x, 1y equals y, x, 2y equals x, y, x, 3y equals y, x, y, and so on as a convenient uh, way to refer to uh, the points along uh, that line. Okay, so the intuition geometrically is that x, n, y is n times as far from x as y. Uh, so I've got a way of talking about integers now. Um, so every pair of points generates a, geo discrete, a discrete geodesic in this way. And in a free geodesic space, uh, all the geodesics are either singletons, that's the degenerate case, uh, because the two points were the same, uh, or the account of the infinite, uh, namely the generating uh, what amounts to the integers. Okay. Uh, so a graph is a geodesic space satisfying wx, uh, yz equals wy, xz. Anyone recognize this? Phil, do you recognize this? Phil Scott? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, this is the interchange axiom. Yeah. Yeah, this is the interchange axiom from category theory when you're doing two categories, but actually it arises all over the place. There's lots of situations where you don't have commutativity or associativity, uh, and yet, well, in this case, uh, in category you do have associativity. We don't have that here, but we still, this is a, a situation where we have neither associativity nor commutativity, where it's a still a useful principle. And it expresses uh, Euclid's fifth postulate in both directions. Euclid only said that if you incline them towards, then they intersect. The converse is that if they intersect, then you must, it must be because they're leaning towards each other. And Euclid thought that by Proposition 14, he proved it. But if you look at the proof of Proposition 14, uh, you'll see that he wasn't thinking about some of the weird spaces like spheres that could provide a counterexample to his proof. And so his proof is buggied in that respect. And so he didn't really prove the converse to Proposition 5 the way he thought. So we need both directions. Uh, and the geometrical in interpretation is flatness, analogous to the million groups, which is the characterization of flatness in uh, geometric al in algebraic geometry. Uh, the fifth postulate uh, strains into both equations as a single equation. Right? Okay. And uh, that's what a grove. So a grove is a flat uh, geodesic space. Right? Geodesic spaces were before we had that axiom. And, oh, and incidentally, uh, it implies the right distributive axiom. So it's not like we've got a fourth axiom here. Uh, it just replaces that weaker principle of inversion that says that a geodesic thing reflects to another geodesic. Uh, so three axioms, and we've got the concept of the grove. 
Um, okay, so uh, this is, uh, I'll skip this one because it's kind of fun, but uh, we don't have time for it. It just shows how uh, you can use, interpret the uh, interchange law as actually constructing uh, this witness trapezium. It does it by taking an arbitrary triangle A, uh, whose base is the base of our uh, desired triangle, and building enough machinery using the, uh, let me just fill this thing out here, there's the whole thing. Uh, so, um, we, oops. Ah. This is badly engineered, I think, from a human interface point of view. Um, okay, let's see if I can get this right. Yes! There we go. Uh, our fifth postulate, EF and HG, uh, you can extend it. So what AB, arrow CD, this is the interchange law. What that's saying is that if you extend EF uh, and HG, uh, they both arrive at the same point, which is the point of intersection. Uh, so that's the given job, I'll pass that. Um, right. Uh, okay. Now that we move on to centroids, that gives us the density. Uh, so every finite, non-empty list of points of groves uh, has a set of centroids defined inductively. The set might be empty, or it might be infinite. So if you took a sphere and you took the north pole and the south pole, and you asked, "What's the centroid of the north pole and the south pole?" Well, it's the infinite set of points around the equator. So you might have a lot of centroids. Uh, so a singleton is its own set of centroids. It's going to be the basis for the inductive uh, notion. And now, if we have a non-empty list of n minus 1 points, uh, uh, then C is a centroid of gamma x. Uh, so gamma x is just gamma with another x tacked on the end. These are lists. Gamma is a list of points. Uh, uh, when gamma has a centroid, uh, satisfying bnc equals x. Remember what bnc was? It was move C out uh, n times as far as bc. So you've got a point. So example, uh, let's take the centroid of a triangle. Uh, so if I have um, a triangle here, and I want to know where is the centroid of that triangle, well, I start by asking what is the centroid of the base. And then I draw a line here, and I say the centroid is going to be one third of the way up the median there. Right? And so what I've said when I say there's B, there's the centroid, and here's the point at the top, A, and that was B and C, I suppose, or something like that. And so here's my point B, of the centroid of the base of the base. Uh, here's my centroid of the whole triangle. And 3 times BC is equal to the point A. OK. Um, so, uh, so what we're getting now is something where, because we're working with lists and not sets of points, we can have repetitions in the list. So if I ask for the centroid of x, x, and y, that's giving x double the weight of y. And so I end up with a point uh, between x and y, or a and b, or whatever it is, such that a has been preferentially weighted by a factor of 2, and so I end up with a third. And if I can get a third, what kind of mathematics would not allow me to get any rational? Right? <laughs> so, uh, it has to be very advanced mathematics. Uh, right, so clearly I have the rationals. Um, all right. Uh, so let's see. Uh, Double check. That's even worse. Let's see, what other complaints do I have about this system? Uh, here we go. Okay. Right, one complaint is it can't hear me all the time. Another complaint is it hears me twice when I clicked it once. Uh, all right, so centroidal growth. The growth is centroidal when every finite, non empty set of elements has a unique centroid, so unique existence. Right? That's the criterion to be a function. So that means that in a centroidal growth, centroid is actually an operation. Henry operation. So the first theorem is that uh, the full subcategory of growth consisting of the centroidal groves is equivalent as a category to the category FQ of affine spaces over the rationals. And you might say, uh, but wait a moment, all we've done here is we've written down some equations. How could you possibly get categoricity in power for the uh, field over which you're working, right? You, what about affine reals, right? What about the real line? Isn't that a model of these equations? Well, it is. Uh, except that when you, when you ask about what are the homomorphisms doing it, doing to it, well, they, they notice that you can pick out any rational subline and swing it away from the rest of it, and so you notice that oh, the topology is missing. Uh, all we've got is uncountably many copies of the rational line interlaid with each other, and they're not connected. So really, what we've got is an affine space of uncountable dimension and not a, an actual real line, and that's why I can get away with saying that this is actually equivalent the category of the affine spaces of the rations. 
Okay, second theorem. Uh, any centroided free chain is definable as a family of operations uh, satisfying two equations per parity. And so that makes the centroidal groves a variety in its own right. Well, that's not surprising. I mean, I already got that in the first theorem. But all this does is it says what the language is that makes it a variety in its own as opposed to simply borrowing from the language of affine spaces. So now I can use my language in place of the language of, uh, of affine spaces. So, uh, so that means I've got my language, and in my language, uh, my language is basically all of the normally weighted linear combinations of the rationals. And so I can say things like, I didn't expect that. Oh, yeah, that was the backward button. Uh, let's see, one of these is, oh, yeah. Uh, B3C equals A. Uh, I should be, yes, you're right. Uh, with, uh, so, no, that's not where I should be. You could probably click twice or something. Let's see. That's forwards. That's forwards. I did it twice and it, it did it once. Sometimes I do it once and it does it twice. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Where was I? Oh, yes. And which button now? Oh, yes, that button. Good. My, my intuition is not geared to this yet. Um, okay, so 2y minus x is the extension operator, right? So give, give me x tend x y, that's 2y minus x. Uh, what about x over 2 plus y over 2? That's, by the way, these are the normally weighted ones, right? 2 minus 1 is 1. And so the <coughs> weights are adding up to 1. A half plus a half, that's 1. Uh, what, what's that operation? Well, that's binary centroid. There we go. OK, so the language of centroidal groves is extension and centroid. Um, analogy, Boolean lattices and Boolean rings uh, have two separate languages. One is logical, one is numerical, um, but they define equivalent categories, right? <coughs> Boolean lattices and Boolean rings are the same category up to equivalence. So, let's see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is this button. Yes! So, there's only one on that side. Oh. Oh, this okay. well, I probably never wrote it, that's the reason. Uh, I need to go back and write something there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good. So, uh, so I'm going to do the operations beyond. Right, these are all the good theorems about affine geometry. So we're going to move on now. So there's the language. There's three operations. So we've got more operations if you count centroid as one operation. Um, perp ABC yields the foot of the perpendicular drop from C to the line AB. Can you all visualize that? Everybody should be able to visualize that. I didn't draw any diagrams because it was too much work, not because I needed to visualize it. Uh, in general, ABC determine a plane as a subspace of Euclidean space. Only if they're collinear would that not happen. And that's going to come out shortly. Okay. Um, that is this button. Yes. Um, so norm ABC yields the point nearest to C on the sphere with center A and radius AB. That's just Euclid's uh, way of drawing circles. Um, so you can think of AB as a setting a scale for all unit vectors. And you, by moving C around, you trace out where all the unit vectors are. And it's tracing out the sphere with radius AB because we don't know anything about dimension. We haven't said anything about dimension. So this could be in a horribly high dimension. It might be in an uncountably dimension space. And you, you and I might be in an uncountably dimension space. We have no idea, right? I mean, we can see. We, we, have, we have ways of constructing at least three dimensions. And if you're a physicist, you could probably construct several more. But uh, most of us are more normal than that. And we only can get up to three. Or, or four if you, if you look at your watch. Some of you are probably doing by now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, here's the next one. Uh, actually, and, and the last. That's nice. Uh, tangent ABC is the nearest point T to B, satisfying any, hence all, of the following equivalent conditions. T is a tangent point from C onto the sphere AB. Right? Just look at the horizon and uh, in however many dimensions we're looking at. So there's this subsphere, which is the horizon. Right? It might be a circle. If, you're in three dimensions. If you're in two dimensions, as you would imagine yourself to be, it's just a pair of points. And you take the nearest one to B, if that's well defined. Um, okay, so another one is T is on the sphere formed as the intersection of the sphere with radius AB and the sphere with diameter AC. That's the same thing. Uh, another one, AB is the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle with side AT equal to AB. That's the one that's the set square point of view when you left your compass at home. Right, so these all I mean these are all just equivalent ways of saying the same definition. So we've got these operations, we're going to call them ECP and T. Oh, I told you that before. Um, I've forgotten that I told you that before, but I wrote it again. Okay, uh, independence and basis. So a subspace is well whatever what else but a subalgebra. Isn't that wonderful? That's how you do it in linear algebra. So now we just say a subspace is a subalgebra. Oh, that's easy. Isometry is isomorphism. Oh, that's different from linear algebra. 
many algebras doesn't even have such a concept unless you stick in a, uh, in a product. And if you have some way of saying what it means to respect the inner product, then in fact isometry then does become isomorphism. But inner product is a little strange in the sense that uh, it's, it's sort of got a bit of contravariance in there that people tend to conveniently gloss over. But when you take the inner product of two things, one of them is pointing forwards, and the other one from category 30 pointing, pointing backwards contravariantly. Most people don't see that. Um, Grassman, however, saw it. And Grassman saw things in incredible depth. It's just amazing. Um, Set of points is independent when no proper subset generates the same space. So it's <coughs> easy to say. Right? Um, spherical, when its members lie in a common sphere, uh, which can be said formally, namely when there exist points AB such that for all members C and ABC equals C, that's when you're using the radius definition, or you could be using the, the, the diameter definition, in which case it's TACB equals C. Ah, uh, Euclidean basis. Well, that's a spherical independent set. Okay. And you'll notice, by the way, that I haven't said anything about whether these bases are going to be used barycentrically or uh, uh, Cartesianly, which brings me uh, to... Oh, oh, and then I should point out here. Uh, actually, that's the next slide. So before I get to that, let me just point out this thing in red. In this algebra table, we're always working in some subspace of space. And from a constructive standpoint, we have no need of the concept of the whole space, partly because you're going to have a, it's going to be a long time constructing uncountably many thing, things if there's uncountably many dimensions. So you just put up with... Uh, the fact that uh, even, even though it seemed like we were trying to uh, wriggle around the um, uh, upward Lohenheim's Golem theorem, uh, we haven't really, because we do have these uncountably dimensioned spaces as models, so we can't prevent them. Uh, but there's no need to work in them if you're not working in them, right? <laughs> if you have any mechanism for getting to the whole space, so you just work in some subsets. So you never talk about the whole space even, constructively speaking. You can't. <coughs> okay. Um, so the difference between barycentric and Cartesian coordinates is a language one. Nothing to do with anything to do with equations or anything. It's such a pure language one. Namely, it's the presence of a constant O, the origin, in the language of the latter. The equational theory is only different by virtue of being able to say more, but only as a conservative extension. Right? We have conservatively extended the language with a constant O and done nothing else. So the rectangular shape of the pyramid at Jose and most city buildings since, but not sort of, you know, if you look down to the backwards of New Guinea, you'll see round huts, and if you look into Mexico, you'll see round pyramids, and that's quite a strong shape. In fact, there's a very good reason for making things round, and they're very strong and self supporting And it's only when you start putting in rooms, because you've got a more elaborate structure in mind, that you discover that rooms don't pack neatly into circular buildings. And so you're encouraged to start laying things out in a, pa in a more packing uh, oriented way. Uh, as Frank Lloyd Wright noticed, uh, that works for hexagons, and if you're in Stanford, you can go visit its hexagon house. But even that is a pain in the butt for most builders who really, really prefer rectangular buildings. Yeah. So one would assume that ever since at least the Pyramid of Jose, and maybe millennia before, uh, that uh, they've been working with Cartesian coordinates. And this strange thing from Euclid was a, a new development that's to totally revised people's thinking to say, we'd better start thinking rigorously instead of using these terrible Cartesian coordinates. Uh, okay, so uh, an n-element basis, so we're going to assume uh, the latter because it's more familiar, but it works the same way. Everything I have to say here carries over to the barycentric case. I'm just not going to talk about it because most people are more used to the other case, so it should be more familiar. So an l-element basis generates an individual space. An axis for a basis is the space generated by an element of the basis, and that element serves as a unit vector for that axis. And remember that I said that the uh, basis had to be spherical. So all the vectors are unit uh, vectors whose length is the radius of that common sphere, or the diameter, depending on which of the two definitions you're working with. OK, the Gram-Schmidt process. Uh, all axes are isometric, given a basis V1 to Vn. The i-th coordinate of the point A is the projection uh, of A onto the axis OBI. Right? You knew that. Right? You should have. Otherwise, you weren't paying attention in geometry class. I mean, in analytic geometry. So, um, since we're always working in a subspace, uh, that means that we aren't guaranteed that new points that we construct are in that subspace. Right? We might busily keep constructing and find that new, well, actually, it's hard to know where they came from, right? If you actually start with a free algebra generated by three things, then you're obviously working in a two dimensional subspace or a three dimensional if it's Cartesian. But if somehow or other somebody hands you a point, uh, you can still find its coordinates, but you had better check that it's in the space. If it's if somebody handed you a point that's not in the space, they might take you by surprise. And so you can check that. What you do is you see whether you recover that point 
And if you do, then it's in the space, and if not, then hey, you've got a new dimension you didn't know about before. And you call that, uh, you use that to define uh, a basis, and you project it, uh, either, uh, oh, that should be P is a typo, that should be N of E A, uh, because we're trying to normalize uh, the new point to being to having the same length as all the other elements of the basis. Right? And that's the Gram Schmidt process, basically. Uh, the full Gram Schmidt process, uh, normalization process, except done constructively, namely whenever you need it. Uh, okay, Euclidean metrics. Since all axes are isometric, uh, any one of them can serve as a ruler to establish a metric. And the following one refers to unit vector. Um, okay, so. Uh, what we can do basically is generate a constructible line in two terms. Uh, the addition and subtraction operations of, of uh, constructibility uh, just affine operations. So, uh, we want to do multiplication, division, and square root. So uh, if we could just do um, uh, division, uh, we could get multiplication from that, obviously. So it's so enough to give uh, how to divide, and that's how you divide. If A and B realize A, B on some axis, uh, then this term will realize A divided by B, and if you've got B and C realizing A plus 1 and A minus 1, then this term will realize square root of A and we're done. Okay, let's move on to uh, non-Euclidean geometry. So the idea here is to take Euclid's fifth and rewrite it using the terms in this form. That's an equivalent form. Um, oh, oh, which one? Let's see. That was, okay, go back and uh, forwards. There we go. Think right. Yes. Right. And then the pointer is this one. Yes. Uh, right. So we're restating it as w x y z x y z equals w. Now here are the variants. Uh, truncate this five, uh, seven letter term to w x y z w x y z x w x y z x y w x y z x y z. That, by the way, is the fifth postulate, right? Uh, w x y z x y z x. And I claim that the models of these things uh, uh, have Gaussian curvature whose sign is the equation number minus 6. So if you subtract 6 here, that's 0. The Gaussian curvature of the space is 0. Above, it's uh, positive. Uh, oh, should, yes, uh, OK, I got the sign backwards. Oh, dear. Uh, yes, above, it's positive, and below, it's negative. I didn't proofread this very well. I didn't write up to five minutes ago to the form. Um, let's, see. Uh, let's see if this works. Yes. OK, so this is what the uh, geodesic plane, the free geodesic space on three generators looks like. Remember, we haven't got the fifth postulate anymore, so we don't have any way of tying things together. What the, those variants do is they tie things together as follows. Let's home in on uh, a portion of this. That's the, sort of the center. And what the, what, what, what the equation is doing is it's taking some random point there and saying it's got to be equal to somewhere around here. Now, if you do x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z, and so on, you will walk around here. And if it's x, y, z, then you stop there. If it's x, y, z, x, you stop there. If it's x, y, z, x, y, there. If it's x, y, z, x, y, z, which is the fifth postulate, you stop there. Now, for each of these, uh, what that does is it ties together this space in a way that makes it a coherent, conventional polytope that has either positive zero or uh, negative Gaussian curvature. Uh, so here you get the octahedron, here you get the cube octahedron. All these things, by the way, have equators. So you might say, there's lots of things I know, but most of them don't have equators. These ones do. Uh, the icosidodecahedron. Yes, that's the last one you get before you get planarity. And that's Euclid's fifth postulate. Uh, further weak or further lengthened, you start getting into the hyperbolic spaces. And if people had known to do algebra in, you know, back in the days when they were fighting over this and people were advising, like, uh, who was it? Um, uh, who was the other? Uh, it was Rob Robachevsky, and then there was, who's the other guy? Boyai. Yeah, Boyai. Boyai's father had worked on this. And Boyai's father advised Boyai, tell us Boyai not to play with this stuff because it would just kill his career. Uh, but if he'd known this, it would be so easy. Um, okay, here's uh, category theory, and that's it. Uh, don't worry about it. This is just locating various things. Uh, that's the category of geodesic spaces. That's what you get when you put in Euclid's fifth postulate. Uh, you can regard that as a reduction in language from abelian groups. You can regard this as a reduction in language from groups. In fact, I gave you what the reduction was early on by saying x squared to the minus 1x. Uh, and it ties in with other categories, like the category of rings. Uh, that goes to abelian groups. There is no category in this corner because there's no such thing as a ring over a non-abelian group. Rings are always over abelian groups. Uh, here's Boolean algebras. Here's a slight weakening, the same one as you get from going from rings to abelian groups. 
uh, set. So down here, there's a nice little loop in here. Uh, in fact, you can define a group. If, if you don't want to teach set theory, what you can do is teach this stuff instead. And, and you say that a set is uh, a, a geodesic space satisfying x, y equals x. That's what a set is. And so you start out, you know, get everybody's intuition going, and, 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 and they understand all this stuff. And oh, and a set. Oh, that's one of these things that are so badly connected. You know, it's just a bunch of points. Uh, it's so bad. Yeah, there you go. okay. Yeah, so this is, this is somehow is that, is that more easy to grasp than the concept of the set. Is that definition Could it well be? I had no idea. <laughs> but anyway, a yeah, set is just, you, you just simply put into the group. So if you go down here, like for example, if you go from abelian groups to groups, uh, you get a, an adjoint where going up is the free adjoint that is the abelianization. Going down is the opposite where you just add a bit of language to constrain things. And I better stop here because I see my hook coming at me at high speed. I have a suggestion. What's Russell's paradox look like in this stuff? That's an interesting thought. I have not oh, then I'll get back to you tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Independently. Uh, so, uh, right, my middle is the next few years. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.